The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, which is very near and dear to my heart for reasons that become obvious if you stay on the show for very long. Uh, but we're thrilled to have you. We have been away for you, it seems like forever. It's been a little less than two weeks. Uh, or has it been exactly two weeks? I don't know. I can't do the math. Um, I was away for all of last week with my son. We were touring some of the CARD, Center for Autism and Related Disorders, offices in Northern California. And oh my goodness, um, we went to nine offices in five days and I learned so much and I met so many amazing people and have come back so inspired and thrilled to be here and more clear on what kinds of things that would be beneficial to people here on the show. So you're gonna see some shifting sands. We are here for this week, uh, this short week, cause we weren't here yesterday due to 4th of July. And we are here next week on Wednesday and Thursday, but then I'm gone for two weeks because I'm going to the Southwestern states. We're going to air all the states, um, all the offices in Arizona, in New Mexico, and a bunch of them in Texas. So if you are in any of those areas and would like an opportunity to meet my son and I, uh, we are gonna be speaking at a, a lot of locations, maybe close to you, send us a line and let us know that you'd like to know where we're gonna be and we'll, we'll get you an invite. How's that for a deal? I already know some people in Arizona that uh, have said, hey, we want to be there. And believe me, we're going to make sure you have seats up front. Uh, so thrilled to have a chance to do that. It's been really, really I don't, inspirational. Just doesn't begin to cover it, but you'll see. We're going to talk more about it later on. Uh, in any case, we're going to be here live for the next two hours talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. You know, for us, we welcome you, whether you are a parent, a teacher, a practitioner, or you yourself are on the autism spectrum, or maybe you just love, I'm just, maybe, not just, because just is not the thing. Maybe you love somebody who's on the autism spectrum and you want to know more. And there is a seat for you at this table for all of us. Uh, we, this entire show is meant to be interactive. We want to hear from all of you. We want to know your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns, and your questions. So our fabulous Samantha is going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us here at the show, some of the different ways that you can have your question be heard. We have a homepage and it is autism-live.com. When you go there, there's a lot of things to do. And one of them, if you click on the triangle that's on the computer screen, you can start the show playing. It will either show you the live show if we're live or the most recently recorded live show. If you want to go back further in, in, into our library and you don't want to leave that site, there's a little memo tab up in the upper, upper left-hand corner of the computer screen. If you click that, it will show you the 100 most recent shows. If you want to go further back in time, please check us out on the YouTube or the iTunes or the Roku or the Stitcher or any of those other places. Uh, it's free in all of those places. And in most of those places, there's a way that you can interact. It's a little bit more obvious when you are on, we're on Facebook Live, by the way. And so if you're on Facebook, you know, you can interact very instantaneous. If you're on YouTube, there's a way that you can interact. But in both of those instances, which are easy and free, it does divulge who you are. And people then can respond to you. Um, you know, so, and in some cases, that's preferable, right? In other cases, you don't necessarily want to put your business on the streets, shall we say. Uh, 
you know, you want to ask a question and not have anybody know who you are or be able to respond to you other than me. If that's the case, you want to go to autism-live.com and to the side of the computer screen, there's a series of white boxes. If you put your cursor in the box that says your question, then you type and that's it except for hitting enter. You don't have to log in. You don't, there's no username. You don't have to register. There's no credit card information that you have to cancel in 14 days. No, there's none of that. It's completely anonymous. It's completely free and no strings attached. And when I say no strings attached, I mean no strings attached. Uh, I know most of the times people are, people are like, well, there's no strings attached, but let us market to you for, for that just doesn't happen. So uh, take advantage of it. And then you, you and I can have a conversation in almost real time when you write in on the live feature. Uh, okay, so there's all of that. And always at the start of the show, I like to remind you that we have a lot of experts who are on the show. And oh my gosh, I'm really excited about today's show because uh, we've got, we got a good one for you. You're going to love it. But I just want to be clear that I am not one of the experts. I think this is a dicey subject for some people because I'm one of those people, I have a very strident voice and I'm, you know, I'm one of those people that I'm like, I, you know, here's what I believe. I'm not shy about stating my opinion. And so people uh, on occasion have mistakenly thought that at least I considered myself an expert. I'm not an expert in autism. I, you know, I'm a mom. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half and he is now 14 and he is beyond belief fabulous. And I am so proud of him and proud of our team. Um, all of those things are true, but and I've learned a lot on the, uh, along the way. I don't want to short sell myself either. I have learned a lot on the way and I have a lot of opinions, um, but I'm still not an expert, okay? And, and I'm certainly not an expert in your life and your circumstances. Um, and I never want to even mistakenly appear as if I think that I am. I know 100% for sure that I'm not an expert in what you have going on. I'm not even an expert in what I have going on. Let's be honest, okay? <laughs> Every time I think I have it figured out, this parenthood thing, my son quickly grows and lets me know that I don't know my rear end from my elbow. And, and, I, and I'm humbled by it, and that's a good thing for me to be. So I am not... I'm not your expert. What I am is your cheerleader. I'm the person who believes wholeheartedly that you can do this. I'm the person who wants to help you to get to the resources. I'm the person who believes that if the resource isn't there, somebody's going to create it. And I want to, I want to be your cheerleader and help inspire you to know that you can do this, that this is doable and that we're going to hold hands and you are not alone. I know I know all too well how it feels in the beginning when you feel like you are alone on a planet that doesn't have communication from another planet, right? Um, I, boy, am I familiar with that feeling. But I have learned over the years that that's just what it feels like, which is not to be poo-pooed. It feels like that and feelings are important. But if I can help you to get into the reality of the fact that many brilliant people are thinking about you, pulling for you, hoping for you, and sometimes have things to give you uh, to help you along your way, boy, that makes my day. So that's what this is about. I'm not your expert. I'm your cheerleader. And, uh, and it's personal to me, right? I made a deal on my living room floor that I, you know, said to the powers that be, please help me to help my child please. And if you help me to help my child, I will do what it is that I need to do. And I promise when my child is doing better, I will turn around and help other people. I have karmic debt to pay off and, and I'm here for you. Uh, and there are lots of ways to contact us as we just went through, but you can also always email me at S as in Shannon, S as in seashells. I don't know what S as in uh, dot Penrod, P-E-N-R-O-D, D as in dog, at autism, we all know how to spell that, hyphen, or the dash, right, the thing in the middle, live, L-I-V-E dot com. You can email me. Okay, uh, I got to pick up the pace here. We got things to do, places to go, people to see. All right, uh, we like to start every morning, every Thursday morning anyway, with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and first of all, we give you an actual definition, and I love to make fun of that. 
because often they don't make any sense. And then we give you a working definition, which is meant to not be exact, but to help you to begin to understand how is this term useful to you, right? Okay, today's term is B, C, B, A. Don't you love it when we go to alphabet land? You know, and you step into a school, suddenly you're in alphabet land. Well, the same is true for autism and psychology. We're in alphabet land. And, and you will hear this term thrown away, around everywhere. BCBA, well, if you're BCBA, and we do it all the time here on the show, and I was reminded by a parent last week that, you know, there was a day when I didn't know what a BCBA was, right? Because I was saying, well, you're BCBA this and you're BCBA that, and here's why a BCBA is important. Da -da 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 -da. And this mom said, I, what is a BCBA? And I went, yes. Thank you, good question. We should always be talking about this. So here we are, uh, what is a BCBA? So uh, let's look at our actual definition. A BCBA, that stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst. Dun, 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 dun. Yay. Um, but what does that really mean? Let's move on to our working definition and then I'm gonna add on to this. So a BCBA is someone who has trained extensively in the application of the principles of ABA. Look more alphabet land. Uh, applied behavior analysis is what ABA is. Now, okay, so a lot of people though hear BCBA, BCBA, BCBA in conjunction with autism and get this wrong assumption that all BCBAs are trained in autism. But look at our definition here. It's someone who is trained extensively in the application of the principles of ABA. Well, we know that ABA, if you've watched the show at all, ABA it has been extensively over and over again proved to be effective in treating autism. It's been considered the gold standard of treatment for autism for, you know, what, 20 years? Almost 20 years. Um, but uh, let's be honest, ABA wasn't invented to deal with autism. ABA is a science that's been around for a really long time that has been used for lots of different things to change behavior and have some behaviors happen more and have other behaviors happen less. That's really the watered down version of what ABA is and it's all built around the principle that everything that we do has a reason behind it, that we do something over and over and over again because there is some form of meaningful paycheck for us. And so ABA kind of breaks that down into a science and says, well, if you do this, you are more likely to see more of this behavior. And if you do this, you are less likely to see this behavior. So they use ABA with, in senior citizen homes. They use it in factories. They use it in businesses. They use it with Olympic athletes. They use it all over the place. And when you have studied to a certain amount and there is licensure that comes with being a BCBA, there is uh, an actual licensing agent that helps to maintain that you actually you sit for an exam and and then you have to maintain your continuing education and you have a license and there are ethical standards that you have to uphold around the principles of ABA and the BACB monitors that so you can't have a license in good standing unless you've learned a certain amount and you're upkeeping it right but it doesn't mean that you don't know about autism. There are many BCBAs that have not trained in the field of autism, have never used ABA with a child with autism. Um, but more and more, I would say it's about 50% of BCBAs now are working in the field of autism. And I think in the next five years, we're gonna see that really get top heavy with autism. But it takes a while to get a BCBA. Um, you know, people who have a BCBA are, have college, are their college graduates, they have a master's degree, and they've taken coursework beyond that to know about the principles of ABA. If you're going to do, be a BCBA in the field of autism though, there is more training beyond that. There are a certain number of hours that you have to work uh, with, with children to be able, you know, uh, to do that. So BCBA is a really important thing for us to talk about because one of the studies that CARD has done that has been very meaningful to a lot of us, uh, last year they, and I don't even know that this study has been published yet, but we've been talking about it here on the show with the people who did the study, that they, we've always been looking for why in some cases is ABA much more effective with some kids on the autism spectrum where they just, 
fly. Uh, everyone makes progress with ABA, but why are some kids making so much progress and getting so much better at skill acquisition so much, much more quickly? And one of the things that CARD found out is that having a very experienced BCBA on your case is a good indicator of how much progress your kid is going to make. I don't think that that's shocking to any of us because really I think of these as the architects of, they design the program. So in other words, we know there, especially at CARD, there's this curriculum that's featured in skills. All of the lessons that have been scientifically proven to, you know, fill those gaps, get those skill acquisitions, reduce other behaviors. Um, but again, why are some kids learning more than others? Well, doing them in the right order for the right kid because we know it's not autism, we know it's autisms. And each child is individual on their own, but there are clusters of kids that we see now, oh, well, um, and I see really experienced BCBAs who look at a child and say, oh, I see you know, that this child can't do X, Y, and Z. I remember treating a child that was like this before and the sequence that we did was this and it worked. Let's try it with this child and they've seen time and time again that uh, that's what's really effective. So having an experienced BCBA or having access to that sort of information is really, we're seeing shaping up to be quite, quite one of the determiners of whether somebody is going to make tremendous progress, which we all want. So BCBA, if you are doing an ABA program, then you should not be doing it without a BCBA who is at least overseeing the design of your program. That's what's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit down with that BCBA. Um, they need to occasionally observe your child, but we've, we've seen that they can do that via Skype, other ways, but they need to be the person who's crafting the path because the path is going to be different for all of our kids and the path is super duper important. You can check to see if somebody's a BCBA by going to BACB.com. I know, alphabet. Um, and you can look them up to see if they are in good standing. Um, and I would suggest that everyone do that, but that isn't going to tell you whether they're experienced in the field of autism. So if you're interviewing BCBAs, make sure that you're asking how much experience do you have? And many times BCBAs will work in a cluster with other BCBAs so that, because everybody has to learn somehow, right? Um, so they will help to be overseen by a more experienced BCBA. And that's really uh, a great thing to do. All right, moving on. That's our dragon for the day. Our question for the, for the day, and this is all going to fit very well with something we're going to talk about in a little while. What do you do when a therapist cancels? And this is a reality of ABA that a lot of the therapists, we're not talking about the BCBAs because the BCBAs are overseeing things, they're designing the program, but the people who implement on a daily basis are often very young. Uh, they're college students usually who have a lot of things going on and sometimes they're traveling. Uh, if they're doing home-based, you know, we certainly had sometimes where a flat tire would happen or a kid gets sick and all the therapists who deal with that kid get sick and then now your child doesn't have a therapist. It happens. But what do you do with that? Because one of the things that I heard uh, many times uh, in, in the last week when we were visiting offices was people who feel the crunch of that. And, and so we've got some suggestions later on for productive ways of dealing with that. Uh, but that's going to come up in, in just a little while. But I want to know from you guys, what do you do when a therapist cancels? Uh, and then we always have a topic of the week. And our topic this week, oh, it's doing something interesting. Uh, there we go. Uh, our topic this week is time. Time. I was saying to my son the other day, uh, you know that, that old saying about we all get the same amount of time as Mother Teresa? It's just what you decide to do with it. So we're going to talk a little bit about time and our perception of time and how to be most productive with it when you are having 
some issues in your household because autism has come to live at your house and you might be in intensive therapy, you might be at school and having therapy on the side and how do we utilize time? And I think that'll be a really fun discussion. But some of the things that are coming up on the show today, uh, in just a few minutes here, we are going to have Alex Plank back on the show. You guys love Alex, I love Alex. He is a young, talented filmmaker and a web designer. He is the genius behind wrongplanet.net. On the spectrum himself, he is getting ready. He's leaving, I think, tomorrow uh, to go to Wisconsin, that he's going to be there for two conferences, and we're going to chat with him about that. In fact, he's gonna, he has agreed to be our man on the street at the conference next week, the, both the health conference that he's leading and the Autism Society of America conference. So we're excited about that. And then uh, normally we would have Bonnie Yates uh, be on the show. And here's the thing, and I'm going to announce this a little bit later too. Bonnie has an IEP this morning, and that's just a reality that sometimes that happens. We weren't able because of the holiday to pre-tape with her. So she's not going to be on the live show today, but we're going to tape with her a little bit later after her IEP. And we're going to broadcast it the same day. So it will be available for those of you who love Bonnie and who doesn't. Um, that will be available for you a little bit later on today. You'll just have to keep an eye out on, on Facebook and YouTube to see when, I don't know what time we're going to air that, but it will be today. So it'll be avail available today. So that plus we have our autism in the classroom tip today. Hopefully we are going to get to our, uh, mindfulness moment and we're going to talk about time. So all of that, but first up Alex Plank after these messages, stick with us. month of July I figured we're gonna do something again that's more for outdoorsiness since it's summertime and I know your kids are gonna be home and you need some activities to do inside and outside so for July I figured we'd make a lantern so let's get started the materials you'll be needing are wax paper an iron crayons scissors popsicle sticks pencil sharpener a glue gun and tape What I did first is that I have my iron heating on medium heat, okay? Make sure you keep this far away from your child because I won't want them to get hurt. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to take my wax paper and I'm going to make four sheets. I'm going to cut out a thing that's about 12 inches long, okay? Now that I have my wax papers cut out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my crayon and if you have kids around, which I hope you do, I'm going to grab them and have them make some crayon shavings. What the shame is you're going to end up doing is making it a design. And again, this is another time for you and your child to talk about colors. You can discuss like what would happen if you mix, you know, some blue crayons and some yellow crayons. What would that produce? When you and your child have finally decided there's enough crayon shavings on your wax paper, what you're going to do next is you're going to take it and fold it in half. Now that I have a fold in half, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an old newspaper and then I'm going to sandwich it in between. And then with my iron on medium heat, I'm just going to have it gently on there just so the wax melts into the paper and becomes one thing. Let's take a peek inside. And as you can see, all the crayons have you know, melted into it, making this beautiful kind of like rainbow-ish color. All right, now I'm gonna do this with the other three that I've made, and then we're gonna assemble our beautiful lantern, all right? So here are my four finished panels that I'm now, I'm ready to build into the lantern. So what I'm gonna do is I have these popsicle sticks, and I'm gonna build them into a square and glue them together with my hot glue gun. While you're building your lantern, it's a good opportunity to work on math skills with your child. You could discuss how many sides a square have versus how many sides does a cube have. Okay, I'm gonna do this another three more times so I have one for every single side. All right, well, now that I have these four different sides built, I am now gonna take these wax paper things that I built and then I'm gonna put glue on here and smash it on there, okay? I know the wax paper is way too big for it, but what we're gonna do later is trim it. All right, so now they're all done being glued together. Now I'm gonna take my scissors and trim along the outside. Now that the four sides are done, I'm gonna take some tape and I'm gonna line the edge of it so they will stay together to make my cube form. And voila, here's my lantern, but it's missing something. 
you're right, it's missing a light to illuminate it. So what I'm gonna put in here is an LED light. I'm definitely not gonna put a real candle or else this thing's gonna catch on fire and that is a real safety hazard, okay? So, here's my little guy and I'm gonna turn it on and so let's see what happens. Ooh, look at that, isn't that pretty nice? And it's not even dark yet. I would love if you shared your pictures of your finished crafts, but until then, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me flying by your side? What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> um, trying to, uh, just, um... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a big one. one. Yes. Uh, autism, uh, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're at the ABCs and XYZs of Special Needs Conference. And this year, for the first time, they've got something really remarkable. It's the Entrepreneurial Boutique. These are all items that have been made and are being sold by individuals who have special needs. So we're going to do a little shopping and talk to some of these fabulous entrepreneurs. Come on. My name is Molly Rarick and I'm founder of Reed's Gift. We're a nonprofit that serves teens and adults with special needs like Chase here. Uh, we were founded in 2013 and serve people in the Conejo Valley, Santa Barbara, and LA. Our main objective is to give our participants the skills they need to gain a more independent life. My name is Shelly Cox and um, Lisa Zalagi and I are founders of Creative Steps and Create Micro Business Enterprises. And the, the items that we're selling here today are all made by the clients who have uh, passions about what they want to make and then they get the profits from what they make after we've paid all of the other expenses. We are here today because um, I, my goal is to be independent and also I would like to share all my artwork and I would like to sell. Thinking about at his young age being a businessman, you know, it's, it's amazing. I cannot be more proud. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're really excited because joining us via Skype right now is one of our favorite guests on the show, Alex Plank from wrongplanet.net. Alex, welcome back. Hi. I just <laughs> turned on my headlamp going camping this weekend. Uh, oh, is that what's on the agenda this weekend? Yeah, I can make it brighter. Well, but let's not do that because then we can't see you at all. Okay. It, it totally makes the camera wig out. So, uh, the, have you always been a camper? I know that, that you've been doing much more camping lately. Has this always been something, or is this a oh, fairly? No. Well, you know, I you know I like off roading in in, in off road vehicles and Land Rovers, Range Rovers. Um, so this is just an extension of that. This camping trip, I will be going on a excursion up into the mountains, and uh, it'll be pretty fun. 
And so right. how many people do you go with when you go? Is it a small um, party or a big party? Yeah, there's only going to be about five of us, so that'll be fun. Now, whenever people talk about camping, for me, there's a couple of different types of camping. There's camping where you're really roughing it. And for me, the dividing line is, are you digging your own toilet? Um, no, I, I have someone to do it for. Oh, I, I see. To, but someone in the party is digging the toilet. There's no porta potty close by. No, there's like a bathroom thing there at the campground. So okay. All right. So you're not doing but, the roughing it kind of camping. Well, I am. I, I have, you know, I'm going to have to be running my laptop off of, you know, my car <laughs> inverter. So I, you know. I got it. I got it. That's a much better type of camping where I'm concerned. There are some people who are just, you know, they, they get no, there's no laptop on their trip. But anyway, so Alex, you're, but after this camping trip, you're getting ready to go to Wisconsin. Oh yeah. Literally the next day I'm getting on an airplane and flying to Milwaukee. And, and tell us again what it is that you're going to be doing in Milwaukee. Cause you got two things going on. Uh, I, well, first I'm going to be doing this conference and you know, obviously if you're going to be in Milwaukee, you should definitely come. Um, and, I have the details right here. But okay. I'll just say it's on July 11th. AutisticHealth.org. I'm going to have to turn my volume down because you're an echo. Okay. Um, but basically, it's uh, autistic adults and other stakeholders engaged together. It's a conference to bring about um, discussions and fostering uh, conversations about autistic health care and, and the gaps there and uh, issues with uh, autistic mortality and uh, what's really great about this conference is it's a way for everyone to get in and have their voice i'm even going to be hosting a twitter chat um first we got to get twitter followers but hopefully from the twitter chat we will but either way like um also crazy thing we're streaming conference so you can actually register for the conference right now Okay, um, so we're we're losing you a little bit here, Alex, where your voice is kind of going a little bit in and out. But oh, can so you hear me now? I, I can hear you. But so I just want to be clear that our viewers got this: that you you're 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 going to be doing some tw things on Twitter with the conference, and you're going to be live streaming the conference. So if people go on and register right now, whether they're in Wisconsin or not, they can participate in the conference and get the information because this is huge information it was always huge information but especially this year a bunch of studies have come to light talking about some of the different medical needs and some of the concerns with individuals who are on yeah the and the spectrum. issue with a lot of those studies is the fact that you know a lot of these studies don't have autistic involvement so uh, what's really cool about this is it's it's something that's really focused on the autistics themselves guiding the research and all of the all of that so you know it's just, um, funded by Corey so. okay so really important but I want to be clear that when you say that the that some of the research that was done didn't involve autistics you mean in terms of setting the parameters of the study and choosing what to study because they were right. studying well, individuals around the spectrum the autistics, right but like what I'm talking about is, you know, patient-centered, you know, research. So it actually involves the patients, the people who are autistic, and the research itself. And that's what's so great about this project. We're getting voices from all over the community. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at AutisticHealth.org, you can go check that out. Okay, AutisticHealth.org. And they can go and register. Is there a cost for registering? No, it's free, and you can watch it from your home and interact and take part. Which is a wonderful thing to do. We all need to be making health a priority uh, for our loved ones and for ourselves. Um, so this is a really amazing thing to do. But if you are in Wisconsin, because you're going to the Autism Society of America conference, if you go just a day early, you can be there in person because you're having a bunch of panels and speakers, Alex. Tell us a little bit about who's going to be there and what they're going to be talking about. Well, we have a great, great group. We have Anita Lesko, Stephen Shore. We have myself. Um, we have Beth Hunter, Kathleen Thomas, and Christina Nicolaitis. Um, I'm just reading these names. I know who they are, but like, I just want to make sure I get their names right. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be really cool. It, it, 
I think it sounds really incredible. I think you've put together a really good conference and I can't wait. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to Skype with you at some point into our live show next week, either both from that conference and from the ASA conference or one or the other, whatever well, you I think fit in your time. I think do both. That would be incredible. I, you know, I, I would prefer that, Alex. I'm, I'm down for that. We have time constraints and if you can skype with us during those time constraints i i would love to have you have you know talk to us from the conference room floor because you know i used to get so angry alex when my kid was first diagnosed with autism i would he read about these conferences and i couldn't get to them i i didn't have the money i didn't have somebody to watch my child yeah. i couldn't travel and i would think probably amazing things are happening at those conferences that I don't know about. I have now been able to go to some of these conferences and you do learn things and there is a feeling and I want to say to everybody, if you have the opportunity to get there, it, there is nothing like that. But sometimes you can't. And when I started doing a show, it was partially because I wanted for people to be able to know what was being said at conferences and have access to that information and have it be available at two o'clock in the morning, not, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday in another state that I can't get to. So yeah, well, we're not going to be available. I mean, technically this is not going to be going on at 2 a.m. in the morning though. So if no, but if we, if we do an interview with you, then people will be able to watch and see what was happening at the conference at 2 a.m. Well, they the can morning. watch it at on their own time at 2 a.m., but I'm definitely not going to be doing right. an interview at 2 a.m. But at least there's recordings of it. Didn't used to be that people didn't used to live stream. Um, so I'm glad that you're going to live stream it because then it'll record it and people can watch it later. And this is important information. So again, the website is autistichealth.org? Yeah. Okay, great. And then, so that's on, is that Wednesday? Is that the day of the week that that's taking place? Is that when the 11th is? Is it a Wednesday? Yeah. Okay. And then on the Thursday, you're then going over to the Autism Society of America conference. What are Wait. you excited about for that conference? What am I excited? Yeah. Is there something that you've already looked at the ASA conference and you're like, oh, that's the talk that I want to go to, or that's the panel I want to see, or what, what are you most excited about? Well, I, I'm really excited about the, the asset conference, but, you know, it's just one of the really great things that, you know, I really like about the fact that, you know, these conferences exist is that there's a whole group of people that I get to see, like Dina Gassner and Stephen Short, my friend John Robeson. Uh, we're going to be hanging out speaking on Friday at the ASA conference. Yeah, I so, do think, you know, I haven't been to every conference, but I've gotten to a bunch of them. And I do honestly believe that if you go to the ASA conference, you get treated to, you will see and meet and get to interact with more adults who are on the autism spectrum than you will at any other conference. Is that fair, Alex? Um, yeah, I think that you see a lot of adults there um, and kids on the spectrum. But, but you see, you have access to groups of adults all the time. And it, with Wrong Planet, I mean, you know, you, you always have access to adults on the spectrum. For, for people who have little kids on the spectrum, this is an unknown to them. They're dying to meet adults who are on the autism spectrum. To see right. all the myriads of possibilities that their kid can achieve and who their kid might be when they grow up. So... I you might be able to be cool like me and have a 1200 lumen headlight. <laughs> and and, and that, that we can look at instead of seeing you, because that's what happens every time you, you put it on the camera, is that the camera goes black. Well, uh, I have it on the lowest setting here. Okay. Uh, I love that you are, you are so typically male, uh, <laughs> Alex, that you are into your gadgets. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's that's so uh, like all the other men that I know. It's gadget, yeah, it's gadget, like John gadget. Robeson has flashlights too. He's uh, we we talk about them. He's like, what's what kind of flashlight did you get? And I showed him, and then he showed me the one that he got. But like, I just wanted to make a correction. You said Wednesday. It's actually on a Tuesday because the eleventh is a Tuesday. Okay, that's what I wasn't yeah. sure about. Okay, well, and we're not usually live on Tuesday, but we'll be happy to tape with you on Tuesday to do okay. that. Okay, we can do that. 
Um, so we'll definitely talk, we'll do housekeeping and talk later about that. Uh, but since we're talking about flashlights, what my son was, he's not anymore. He's, he's not into the flashlight thing, but he was, and especially when he was little, he always took flashlights and took them apart. What is the fascination with, with flashlights? Well, I think, you know, it's something that brings light to, to the dark. Uh, And if you need to find your way, a flashlight We'll serve that purpose. Well, that's kind of beautiful, Alex. I really kind of like that. Okay, so back to the ASA conference. For you, it's like a gathering of dear friends and great minds. Um, give us a little insight, Alex, when a group of individuals who are on the autism spectrum and adults get together, what what are the issues that you, what are the hot button issues that you guys are talking about right now? Health, obviously, right? Um, what do you mean? Can you clarify? So when you guys get together and, and you're talking about issues for the, the community, for the autism community, what, I, I know, I talk to individuals such as yourself all the time who say nothing about us without us, right? Yeah. Um, that's super duper important. But when you get together a group of, uh, of individuals who are on the spectrum and who are adults, what kinds of issues are most important to you? What do you feel like the conversation turns on? What are you guys talking about? What's important? Well, I, I think the, the most important thing is uh, being part of the conversation. And unfortunately, that's something that still is an issue um, where we're not being included. You know, I live in Los Angeles where, you know, there's Hollywood. And there's like an effort to be inclusive when making stories about autistic characters, but you know, even that is an uphill battle. I, you know, I've seen some shows recently that are coming out and they're like, oh yeah, we consulted with an expert. And I'm like, well, if you're making a show about someone who's autistic, who lives that life every day, I don't think someone who studies autistic people is the expert on like being autistic. It would be the person themselves. And, and yet they still like think that's good enough. Oh yeah. Well, we, we consulted someone at UCLA or USC or wherever yeah. and didn't ask a single autistic person or if they did, they didn't get credited or paid or they just sort of were used. So I think that that's a big problem that needs to change. I think in the scientific community, that's, needs to change too. I think that just in society in general. Yeah. And it's uh, only, it's something that we can only get by uh, speaking up and, and, and demanding it. Absolutely. You but are also having allies like yourself and other people who are not on the spectrum as allies. Absolutely. And you know that I will fight for your right to have a say with my very life. Um, It's super important to me because I am the mother of a 14 year old who's on the spectrum and, you know, in fighting for your right to have a say, I am fighting for his right to have a say. So to me, that is a no brainer. But Alex, often the group of parents and self advocates or individuals who are on the autism spectrum, it's not always a happy marriage. Would you agree that, that, no. that parents don't always get a, along with adult um, self-advocate groups? I guess so. Uh, but, I mean, people in general just don't get along. I don't think that's something specific to autism. Okay. I think that's fair. I, as much as I'm always going to fight for your right to have a seat at the table to, ha- to be a part of the discussion, because I think the discussion doesn't happen in a productive way, unless you and other people who are adults on the spectrum have a seat at the table. But I also am in the camp where I believe that parents of children have to have a seat at that table too. And I think sometimes that's where I tick people off. And you and I don't necessarily totally agree on this, right? About what? I mean, I don't... That I feel like parents have also a right to have a seat at the table when talking about autism. I mean, I think parents already have a seat at the table for the most part. 
Well, I, to be fair, Alex, I do think, not you, but that there are other self-advocates who feel that that is not, not that they're trying to take away the parent's right to be at the table, but that that in no way is, that a parent's voice is no, in no way representative of the community. Right. Do, and, and, I mean, and there are people who say that, so for instance, if you have a group of people that are doing something and th you have parents who are on the autism spectrum, uh, I honestly believe that there should be at least, if you, let's say you have five autism parents and they're saying that they're, they're, you know, they're doing a charity about autism or they're doing a project about autism, you've got five autism parents and you don't have a single adult who's on the autism spectrum, I don't feel like that is a, an equal balance. I don't think, I really think you're probably going to miss a perspective. But I also feel like if you have five um, individuals who are on the autism spectrum that are adults and they're putting forth agenda about the autism community, I think it's important for there to be a parent of a child on that committee as well. And that that's not fully balanced unless you have a parent there. Well, I mean, if you look at most of these committees right now, that's like, it's the opposite of that, really. I do There's think mainly that mainly parents. I do think that it is mostly parents. And I so, agree with you that it needs to be more even. I just don't, don't want to. I don't think that by saying, I, I think that the issue here is that, like, I don't think that's going to be a problem because okay. clearly you're out there advocating. Um, you know, people on the spectrum are out there advocating. There's going to be room for everyone to talk. I believe that. This. I firmly believe that. But the, the uphill battle right now is getting, unfortunately, getting autistic people's voices heard. And I think what that's do you the, think we need to we do to make that better, Alex? What has to happen? I think one thing, you know, that and John Robeson talks about this a lot is um, the times that a lot of times autistic people are uh, asked to contribute to things that they're asked to do so for free or for little to no pay um, when you know they're the ones that's getting most of the money but yet you know there's been plenty of instances where you know big organizations you know, have people on salary asks an autistic person to volunteer for the good and you're like well you're not volunteering you get like a 401k and if you're lucky if Okay. Yeah. The, one of the examples that was brought up recently that, for instance, in these health studies, the people who were doing the studies, as you said, were not on the autism spectrum, but they were studying people with autism. Um, but other than, you know, whenever people are a part of a study, usually there's like a, you know, sometimes you get a gift card, there's a small amount of money that's being paid, but the people who get the most money are the people who are doing the study. Um, right, and, and the and the and the organizations that are funding it, and I mean, doing the study, you, know, you can't give too much conversation. But like people who are working, who are on the spectrum, who are helping to guide the direction of the study, the direction of the research, um, people on the, you know, they side, should get paid. Other side of the, yeah, the table. Yeah. I got to be honest that, you know, I, I get asked to be on committees a lot um, for different things. And I have never, I never get paid for it. For, for what? <laughs> I, like for all kinds of things. I get to be, at, I get asked to be on a committee that's going to create a policy or that's going to like research something or whatever. Sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get a gift card or something, but I've never gotten paid for it either. I didn't even know that when you consult, I, I do know people who get paid for consultation, but most of the time as an autism parent, when I consult, there's never even any discussion about pay. Um, so I don't know whether that's just a thing or whether I'm just not well, I mean, smart. but you have a salary, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. but, but that's, but, but again, this is, this is my job, um, right. versus, um, yeah, but we don't pay anybody to be a, uh, to be a guest on the show. We don't pay anybody. I don't, you know, it's true that we don't pay you to be a guest on the show. We don't pay Dr. Grannon to be a guest on the show, but I don't pay anybody to be a guest on the show.
Yeah, but I'm I'm still waiting for that fifty thousand dollar check that you promised me. I promise you, no, no, but let's, uh, I never, let's be clear that I never promised uh, any kind of a check to Alex, but I have referred people to you for paying jobs, have I not? That is true. I actually have gotten some jobs because of you, yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking out for you and I'm always trying to help make sure there, I mean, let's be honest, there have been times that people have come to me and said, would you like to... Uh, you know, we're working on this script and I have said, no, I think you know, you need to talk to and I've given them your phone number. Um, yeah. I, I've also, you know, shared other people's numbers depending on which coast they were on. Um, so, um, yes. I believe, I am 100% with you that those kinds of consultation jobs should be paid because they would be paying, you know, if they were paying a poker expert to come in because the movie was about poker, that poker expert would get paid. There is a poker tournament coming up soon in September. There is a poker tournament. With uh, Ed Asner. With Ed Asner, and I'm very excited about that. Are you going to play this year again? I think so. That's a good thing. I will more than likely be there win. to cover it. I, I hope so, Alex. I, I hope that you would win. Um, I hear that Ed is a pretty good poker player, though. Uh, so... Uh, and Matt almost won last year, I think. Mm, eh. Maybe. I mean, he wasn't, like, that close. All right. I don't uh, think he even came in second place. Oh, I, I think mean, to be fair, I lost. Second. And I, I would have lost sooner, but Rosie O'Donnell had to leave, and she gave me all her poker chips. Oh. She was like, here, come here, and, like, just, like, gave me this massive pile of poker chips. Well, that was nice all. of her. And you lost She them asked me later if, who won, and I was like, I don't know. Definitely I'm pretty sure that Matt came in second. Really? I, I wouldn't write that in blood, but I'm almost positive that he came in second. That's what my memory well, recalls. But I had left him a run long for before. His money, if that's the case. Well, uh, in any case. So let's cycle back. This has been a great conversation, but let's cycle back to make sure that people know. Go to autistichealth.org, register. They're only going to be able to watch the live stream if they register, correct? Yeah, you got to register. You, you should register, like, and then, like, even if you're not sure you can make it, like, just register right now and, like, attend okay. because it'll be worth it. And, and it's then, free to register, so, like, if you register and you don't go, you didn't waste any money. Right. And if you register and you're not available to watch during the live stream, is it going to be recorded so you can watch it later? I hope so. Okay. If well, it isn't, that's that would suck. It would suck. But we'll we'll check back with you on that. But I would imagine uh, that there's a way for you to do that fairly. I easily. would imagine. I would imagine yeah. too. And then for people who are going to be at the ASA conference in Wisconsin, you know, they should go first to the Autistic Health Conference, which, what is that being called again? What is well, the it's, it's, uh, asset? Well, yeah, but that's the, that's the acronym. Okay. And what does the acronym stand for? Uh, Autistic Adults and Other Stakeholders Engaging Together. Okay, fabulous. And, and then stick around for the Autism Society of America conference and go to that and get to meet people like Alex um, and you will definitely learn a lot at both of these conferences. Really, really wonderful. And we're hopeful next week that it's going to work out that we're going to have Alex Skyping in with us um, from the conference and hopefully he'll have his flashlight on, on then so he can be blinding us so we can be looking at a, a dark screen and nothing. And nothing else. Can uh, you see me now? I can. I can see you now. I'm. Get, we're getting a lovely shot of your beard from the side, and now we have the glare. Uh, Alex, I adore you. You know that I do. Um, and we'll <laughs> we'll connect with you. I hope you have a wonderful time camping. Yeah. Oh, did I tell you uh, I was uh, doing improv? No. With Second City. When is that happening? I don't know. I took like a whole like course and did a performance. And I didn't get an invitation to this. Well, it was improv one, so I would have. I was really good, and I guess all my all my teammates were actually really good too. So it actually would have been a good show, but I didn't know. So. <laughs> all right. Well, you should invite me next time if I if I can at all. I love improv. And I love taking my son to improv. Well, you know, Second City is gonna is doing this giveaway with Wrong Planet. They're gonna be giving away uh, 
uh, a class to a kid with autism in the Toronto area. So, oh, how wonderful. What a great, great thing. Improv is yeah. so great for our kids. You know, I used to teach improv. Yeah. I did. Oh. So, uh, in any case. Cool. Anyway. Uh, yeah, Wrong well, that's .net. wrongplanet.net, especially if you're in the Toronto area. What do they have to do to register for that? Well, I had to write the article about my experience doing the improv class first and then put a link to the giveaway contest. Okay. Well, sounds exciting. Invite us next time, okay? Yeah, I was thinking about taking a second level. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. It only can help, right? Improv skills only help you in everything that you do. Well, it helps you in so many ways that you wouldn't think about. So, like? Just like various like ways of thinking on your feet and being more clever in social interactions and being able to improvise. And the yes and portion is actually really constructive for having conversations, especially for autistic people that might be very rigid in the way that they communicate. This would really open it up for you. I, so I highly I, recommend it. I'm going to make sure that my son watches this interview because on, I'm not kidding. On 4th of July, when we were at the fireworks, we were sitting there and the phones had all died and we were forced to do the unthinkable, which was speak to each other. And we were playing all these parlor games that we don't play very often. And I said, let's play yes and. And my son was like, you know, he did not want to do it. Um, yeah. But eventually he did. But yes and is a great game to play, as you said, with individuals or anybody um, it helps you to become a more effective speaker, I think. It really does, and I'm actually going to start doing stand-up. I actually went up to an open mic. Again, why am I not invited? Well, it's an open mic, so. Like, I, you know, I'm, I can't come to an open mic? I mean, you could. Anyone's allowed in. But, like, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which one it is. So All right. You're have to guess. Well, once you get more comfortable, invite me. I'd be happy to come. Yeah. I mean, you, you've seen me speak before. It's basically that, but geared towards a neurotypical audience. Right. I'm sure that it's wonderful. Yeah. I'm sure that it's wonderful. Well, cool. Well, thank you for having me on. Thank you for being on, and we'll talk to you about connecting about next week, but have fun camping in the meantime. Oh, yeah. Be safe. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. That was Alex Plank from wrongplanet.net. Definitely check that out. Alex created wrongplanet.net when he was a teenager because he didn't have anybody that he could talk to about the things that were happening in his life. He wanted, he wanted to be able to have a conversation and that has taken off and blown up into a way that people all over the world, parents and in, teens and adults who are on the autism spectrum talking and sharing advice and resources um, uh, to lead a happier life. Isn't that what it's all about? So there you are. And make sure that you register at autistichealth.org, uh, for that free, uh, being able to watch the live stream of that conference. It promises to be really amazing. All right. We are going to take a break and come back and talk about time. If you were tuning in and going, where is Bonnie Yates? Let me just tell you, if you weren't here at the start of the show, Bonnie had an IEP this morning. So she's not going to be with us during this time period. She's going to, we're going to be filming with her a little bit later on today and it will still air today. You'll see it on YouTube and on Facebook live. Um, I just can't tell you what time because we don't know when the IEP will be over, but it will still be today. You need your Bonnie fix. I know. And by the way, I didn't mention this morning, it was on the screen and I thought that I said it, but in just a little while, we're going to be joined by David Humphrey from Kirkman Labs. He, a couple of weeks ago, we had a guest on talking about a book, uh, preventing autism and there was a lot of people who wrote back and had objections and said this is you know pie in the sky and I tried to whenever I had time to reference the P2I study. Well David Humphrey is here to talk about the P2I study and some of the other things that are going on that he knows about because he's very involved with research um, and what the P2I study is, what we've learned about autism from it, what we know now that we didn't know before and and I think he's got some really good advice about for people who have feelings about that, what you might want to know that will help you to get your head wrapped around this and, and look at it in a more proactive way um, than to be have your feelings hurt by it. Because I think a lot of people's feelings were hurt. So that's all coming up in the next hour. We're going to take a break first, and then we're going to come back and talk about time. Stick with us.
Um, being part of this community is really important to a mom um, with a son like Jackson because it really does take a village and you need so much support, you know, to, um, to help bring out all of the amazing qualities and um, skills and talents that our children have. So I'm, I'm just very grateful to everybody who was a part of this. I think it helps with all sorts of that uh, self-esteem, social skills. They seem to communicate a little bit with each other and they had a lot of friends. Um, the helpers were phenomenal and I think the social skills for sure because they, you know, they worked together and they did a couple of group things across the floor and they sang songs together and I, I yeah, for sure, I think it's a really huge deal. A great program. What programs like this show is the person is in front of what we call today a disorder. I think what we're finding is that uh, these sorts of brain challenges that make people unique can actually be gifts in, in ways we haven't discovered in the rest of society to, to bring them out. So when you see a program like this and you see the kids dancing, having fun and making up jokes, making up the story, I was here when they did that. That was so amazing to watch because they were all focused, they were all present, and they were all laughing, they were all getting into the creation of this story. And um, that to me sort of broke the barrier to say, now well, first we're dealing with people and, and then we're dealing with the challenges. Welcome back to Autism Live. One of the things that we promised we were going to talk to uh, talk about today is time. And I was saying that I was just discussing with my son that, you know, that old adage about we all get the same amount of time as Mother Teresa. It's just a matter of what you decide to do with your time, but you have that bank account that has the exact same amount of time that she had. Uh, okay, so when you're an autism parent and you're looking at time, it's really a juggling act again and again and again, right? And the juggling act, by the way, changes. In the beginning, when your child is first diagnosed, when they're two, two and a half, three, you're really trying to get that 40 hours of therapy in and that's really got to be your focus and you got to build everything else around that time and really there's no other way to do it if you try to say well you know we want to do the 40-hour program but we need to get to Gymboree and we want to do Little League and and all of those things and you put them all as equal importance I can tell you what's going to happen you're not going to get 40 hours of therapy in and while I think that the Gymboree classes and Little League are super duper important I, when you have a window of time in which you know that you can be more effective than any other time in your child's life and that they can play Little League on a more consistent basis in a couple of years and if they get this therapy they're going to be better at it. For me it was a no-brainer that I must prioritize the 40 hour a week program and that speech and OT come after that. Um, a lot of times parents get confused about this because your funding source will say to you, oh no, it's 40 hours a week maximum with everything entailed. I will tell you that there are loopholes in that, but if that is the hard and fast and you've done the research and they say, nope, we're not paying anything past 40 hours, then for a child who's three, the research is clear. Spend the 40 hours doing a, an intensive ABA program because with a three-year-old, you're going to get speech and OT within that ABA program. If you can, and I think most funding sources, if you push, you can get them to fund the 40-hour ABA if you've got the prescription for it, and then on top of that, get the speech and OT from another funding source. We have lots of parents that have been successful for that, but again, if all you've got is the 40 hours, do the ABA program at least for those early years. Later on, your child goes to school and now it's a different juggling act. How do you spend the time? You probably aren't going to have time for a 40 hour a week program anymore when the child starts school. Um, so you've got to pri prioritize. In fact, at five, is school the right place for the child or could they do much better with a 40-hour program and delay going to school a year. Parents have done it. 
Um, once, once your child is ready and needs to be at school, then very likely uh, there would be an automatic shift of a reduction of some hours with your ABA program. But still, it's hard. How do you balance having a life, doing your ABA program, having school, doing homework? And it really means you got to prioritize and say, you know, what we were able to do is to say to teachers, when does the homework have to be done? Because on this day, we're ABA heavy. We really don't have time to do homework. And we were able to work out a system where we could turn in homework when we had the time to do it. In fact, they just said, oh, we're just going to take it on. Is Friday okay? Can we just accept the? And then I had a whole week to plan how to do the homework, hand it all in on Friday. As my child got older, you know, it's a constant shifting sand, but you got to know what your priorities are of what to do with the time. And we always prioritized ABA. And I've never been sorry about that. So with that in mind, there are a couple of things that happen in your life. We asked you the question earlier today, what do you do when a therapist cancels? Well, if you've prioritized your life and said, you know, we're getting our full prescription because we're 100% clear on the studies, we know how important that is, so we're prioritizing. We've rearranged our life and then a therapist is supposed to be there to meet your child or to come to your house to meet your child and they're not able to come and you get the phone call, you get the text, whatever, saying that they can't come. What do you do then? And, um, you know, I was talking with a lot of parents last week and asking this question, what do you do? And a lot of them said, basically, you know, I feel frustrated. And I, and I said, okay, that's what you're feeling, but what do you do? And some parents had some really great ideas about what to do, and I wanted to add mine into that. Um, that some parents have a set thing that if a therapist can't come, if there's no fill-in to come, that they have a set fun thing to do that's educational that they go and do like a, their favorite museum or their, their favorite um, sensory gym where they can go to and that that's their fallback that they know if somebody cancels, this is what we're going to do so that we don't lose this time. It's fun, it's educational, and that's what we're going to do. Um, but what if there's a fill-in available? So your therapist that was supposed to come couldn't come. A lot of times your ABA provider will offer you a fill-in. This is another ABA trained therapist. They may not be as experienced as the therapist you had. Um, they may not know your child. And so a lot of parents were telling me, I don't feel comfortable with that, so I just cancel the session. And I want to ask you to walk with me a little bit and say, what if? What if you didn't cancel that session? And a lot of parents, you could feel the angst of, oh, but they don't know my child. And, you know, and then they're going to, they don't, you know, it's going to be a waste. It's not going to be useful time. It's this, it's that, whatever. And I was able to share with some parents what was taught to me early on. The very first family, which was Logan Shepard's family, they were the ones who told us about CARD and got us started at CARD. It's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I love Logan. Uh, he was little Logan then. Uh, but his parents sat me down and said, here's what you need to know. Never cancel a session. Like that's gold, that is time in your time bank. And they knew, even before the study showed, that it's one of the biggest factors in whether your child makes success is how and how much success is how much time they actually have doing therapy. So never, they said to me, cancel, cancel a fill-in session. But what they suggested that I do is use those fill-in sessions to work on maintenance. So when your child is doing therapy, they will master something. There'll be something that, some skill that they learn, let's say that they learn blue, the color blue, and, and they've gotten it. They can do it in you know three out of five trials. They can do it with different people. They can point to something and say, what color is that? Blue. They know what blue is. Great. It goes in the mastered file, which then goes into maintenance. Because sometimes our kids gain skills and they go away. They just disappear. This was certainly my kid, and this is a lot of kids who are on the autism spectrum. So instead of canceling a session when some when you're you know the therapist who knows your child your therapist can't come you take the fill in who never has met your child before let's say that you know maybe they've met them once but maybe they've never met them before they come in and what i was told you just have them run everything that's in your child's maintenance because by the way your therapists are supposed to do this on a semi-regular basis but the therapists don't love doing it 
because it's old stuff, it's not exciting. Um, you know, so they don't, it's not high on their hit parade list, right? Whereas for the fill-in, they're the perfect person to run the maintenance folder uh, because they don't know your child. And really, for your child to be considered that they've actually mastered the skill, it means they could do it with anybody, even somebody who isn't trained in ABA. So it could be this ther ther therapist's first day, and they're not perfect at it ideal person to be doing the maintenance folder with your child because if your child can do it with this person who doesn't know them and is fairly new to ABA your child really has this skill and it's great and we check off the little box we did maintenance we don't need to come back to this for several months if ever right um, if your child sits down and that with this therapist who doesn't know them and the, the therapist runs it and your child can't do it then we got to open this back up and look at it and see did they in fact learn this skill and really truly master it or have or is this skill starting to go away by having run it sometimes then then you know your therapist who's normal you know the regular therapist scheduled therapist your therapist comes and they see oh they ran this in maintenance and they weren't able to do it they do a fine tuning now the next time the fill-in comes, they do it again, and guess what? Your child can do it. That's a skill that you help to make sure that your child, this is useful time. When I tell you this is one of the secrets that got us good success, I'm, I'm giving you the secret sauce here. Don't cancel. If the therapist can't be there and you're offered another one, use it. If, they, if you're not being offered another therapist, try to reschedule within the week sometimes certain funding sources let you reschedule within the month but then take that time and use it i really love the idea of going to a re-rock the spectrum sensory gym getting out your yayas, having that socialization and that physical um, thing but my first choice my first choice would be to take a fill-in it's really good for your child's program and helps to maintain skills it's the ideal thing to do. I hope you'll consider doing that. That's my little advice about time. That's an effective use of time um, because once you cancel it and let it go, you can't ever get it back. And I can tell you, I have no regrets about things that we put off doing so that we could do therapy. If I have any regrets, it's that we didn't use every single minute we could have. I'd like to go back and do that part over again. Uh, so there you have it. All right, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with David Humphrey. He's going to be talking with us about important new research, P2I, what we know about autism that we didn't know before. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Yvonne Johansson and this is My Little House. My Little House is an interactive, multi-sensory, educational felt toy that I invented to help develop children's language skills. I love My Little House. I've been working as a speech therapist for over 20 years. I have spent my entire career working with young children. I have worked with children with language delays, and I have many children with significant cognitive disabilities and children on the autism spectrum. It has been a constant challenge finding toys that are fun, educational, and actually engage my students. In every preschool since I've been a young therapist, we carry on these felt boards. Kids love them because they're soft and they're fluffy, and there's usually these little pieces that attach to these boards because felt sticks onto felt. You bring them into the activity because they're now they're putting a piece on the board. So it's almost kind of like magic. So then I just thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just take this one-dimensional board and make it into an actual three-dimensional toy? How cool would that be? That's the idea behind My Little House. You can spread it out flat like a four-panel felt board, or here's the cool part. In the blink of an eye, My Little House easily converts into a three-dimensional reversible house. This is the outside. This is the inside. My Little House comes with 36 felt cutout pieces that match outlines in eight colorful rooms. And they're felt, so they stick. Each piece inside My Little House has been placed with purpose. For instance, in the kitchen, whole half 
under, on top, inside, big, bigger, and biggest, empty and full, circle, triangle, inside, outside. Really cool thing, I have a nonprofit, Lecotech. They are the folks that put out the Differently Able Guide for Toys R Us. They've been doing it for 25 years. They gave me their seal of approval as a toy that they feel is a toy with purpose and that will make a difference. But My Little House isn't just for kids on the spectrum or with significant disorders. It's also for typically developing two to five year olds. It's a fun toy. Recently, I took My Little House to the American Speech and Hearing Association convention in Philadelphia, and the response from my peers was overwhelming. Hundreds of therapists, teachers, and heads of school districts wanted to order them. It was real validation for me that this truly is a toy that needs to get out there. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod. I'm a proud autism mom, I'm a former educator, and I am the host of Autism Live. And as all three of those things, I want to recommend to you My Little House. This is one of the smartest toys I have ever seen for teaching language to kids who have emerging language. Whether they're on the autism spectrum or completely neurotypical, it's a great, fun, reinforcing toy, but it's especially great for our kids that are on the autism spectrum because it makes learning fun and it makes it tactile. They have these felt shapes and they get to match them up. And I'm telling you, even the adults love to play with this. We loved this toy so much that we wanted to be able to bring it to you at a great discount. So right now, if you will go to www.smartfelttoys and when you get to the coupon code, put in a-live.com, you'll get $5 off. Isn't that great? So I want to encourage you, go and get My Little House for all the kiddos in your life. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're really excited because joining us via Skype right now is David Humphrey. And I, I say a lot of times, you know, this is one of my favorite guests. I want to tell you that more often when I'm out in, in public and talking to people and they talk to me about what's been the biggest thing or the most exciting thing, I'm always going to be saying David Humphrey because he gets me inspired. He talks about things uh, and the research that's being done, and I just, I get really hopeful whenever David is on the show, so we're thrilled to have him back with us. Uh, and David is, is coming to us from Kirkman Labs, but we're not, that's really not the focus. We really invited David to come and talk with us specifically about what P2I and about what we know now that we didn't know before, because uh, I think there's a lot of confusion out there. So first of all, welcome back to Autism Live, David. Well, thank you. And thank you for the kind words. I really have enjoyed the relationship with you over the years, and thank you for having me back. Well, thrilled, because as I said, I always feel hopeful. I, I have this thing in my head where I, I always say, well, smarter minds than, uh, than mine are working on things, and, and I never feel closer to that than when I'm talking to you. So we, we're going to let you do some talking. You've got some slides because you're going to educate us a little bit. So where do you want to start, David? Well, maybe start on slide one because this is introducing uh, the group that I'm talking for, which is the Forum Institute. And most of your listeners probably aren't familiar with the name, but the Forum Institute is the largest think tank for special needs children in the country. And we've done this for the last 50 years, trying to untangle how we can begin successful diagnosis and treatment, and how we can bring government researchers together to work for the benefit of the uh, people affected with autism and special conditions in this country. Amazing. So, uh, second slide is really the current vision that we have. And the vision is really an ambitious vision, and it's significantly reduced the chronic disease in the children with prevention programs. And we go all the way back, I used to be the attorney for Bernie Rimmel, and Timers remember his name, but he's known as the father of Bernie And Bernie believed that the long solution is to prevent new cases. So we 
focus on the children that need to go in and help with jobs, with finance, and housing. Because we have a crushing number of children coming into the system. We can't service the people who really need the services. So third slide, very quickly, the APN was the first project of the forum, and that set in motion seventy million dollars in government funding and became part of speaks, but it basically was responsible for almost all the medical programs and insurance coverage in the state right now and lots and lots of publications. So we set those think tanks and publish papers because we wanted to establish the fact that autism was in fact medical condition. In fact, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, medical conditions were not treated by MDs, all sent to psychiatrists pretty much. So the fourth slide shows the approach we had, which was to go into major publications like pediatrics, putting science think tank people together, and the landmark paper was a 75-page insert in pediatrics on conditions. That was rated as one of the top five papers in the last uh, 10 years, the special needs by IA. The next one, number five, was really identifying not about statistics, it's about boys like pets. And David, I'm gonna stop you for just a second because yeah. we're, we started having a little problem with the audio where it's cycling. Um, so we're gonna go to a break really quickly. We're okay. gonna clean that up and then we're gonna come back. So don't anybody go anywhere because it's, this is exciting information. So stick with us. We're gonna be right back after these messages. Okay. down dog next so with down dog there are several different ways that you can do it and I want to show you first and then help you with yours so that we can work on what feels good for you okay all right because there's no right way to do it it's more about what your body likes all right so for me what I'm gonna do is start off with my hands at the top of my mat my headlights my fingers are, are um, aiming towards the top of my mat and then I'm going to tuck my toes and then my head is also gonna drop and I'm going to look between my toes. Okay. Okay. And my body should be, or hopefully, like an A shape. Or V. Or V, yes. <laughs> Upside down V. Yep. And so if your quads are tight or your hamstrings are tight, you might need to bend your knees a little bit. Set it to you. <laughs> or if your shoulders are a little strained or a little tight. Remember to push in through your feet, but also sometimes what feels really good is going down your forearms like this. You can actually start out this way instead, it's a little easier. So your forearms rest on the floor. You still tuck your toes, and then you're still looking between your toes, but rather than being on your hands then, your weight's along your hands and your forearms. Okay? All right. So. So, yep. 
You're gonna do on your hands? Okay, yep. So your fingers are facing the front of the mat. Or are you doing forearms? Forearms? Okay, there we go. Wow, you're very bendy. Very nice. And your gaze is right here between your toes. Excellent. Very nice, Jem. Wow. Awesome. Feet are a nice distance apart. How does that feel? Okay. Awesome. You want to come down? Excellent. Good. Welcome back. We are back here with David Humphrey and he is, we had a little bit of a sound issue. So we're kind of do a reboot here. <laughs> so welcome back, David, and thank you for your patience with us. Let's sure, you get a recap so that nobody is uh, left out of the conversation. Go right ahead. Okay. So we're going to start with a name most of your viewers won't know, and that's the Form Institute. It was formed 15 years ago for the purpose of taking very complex products and special needs problem solution and publishing for the benefit of the parents and the children. And uh, that's a group I'm representing here today. So slide two is our current vision, and the vision is really a bold one. It's to reduce chronic disease in the world's children with prevention protocols. And we believe we're not talking about a small dent. We think we can reduce chronic disease within 10 years, including autism, chronic conditions is, is autism, uh, by about 50% within 10 years, and that's the goal. The third slide gives a little history. We started 15 years ago. We set in motion about $70 million worth of funding for autism research with NIH. Uh, that resulted in a whole range of medical protocols. Uh, on our group was the current or past president of the American Pediatric Association. That resulted in insurance coverage in most states for medical conditions and lots of NIH publications. And we did that on slide number four with publishing really comprehensive major inserts in pediatrics. So the, the primary one we started with was gastro, is connected with autism. It was 75 pages, and it was done by 26 of the top gastroenterologists in the country, led by Tim Bowie and Margaret uh, Bowman. Slide number five is what, obviously, what I've been part of in the last 15 years in this community, starting with meeting and the attorney for Bernie Rimmel, and that is, these aren't just numbers. These are kids we love. These are kids that are miserable every day with gastro conditions. And because of the publication, we were really excited about the fact that now it's become pretty well established that kids with autism, many of them, at least half, have medical conditions. And the primary one is gastro conditions. The last paper we did, and by the way, that paper won one of the top five papers of the year by the government agency, IAC. Uh, we just recently published one uh, a couple of years ago. And that was with Margaret Bowman, early identification. And here's what's really exciting about it. We said identification can occur in one-year-olds before the autism symptoms develop. And it can be corrected and prevented. And Doreen Grand Fache is on our board. And by the way, for those of you that know her, you love her because she's done some pioneering work with one-year-olds. And we're really able to put together some exciting programs. The problem is, on slide number seven, the United States is catastrophically inefficient in medical care, especially with special needs children, especially with diagnoses, treatment, and uh, uh, be able to have uh, significant recoveries. Slide number eight is the reason why, is our medical system was set up to treat uh, things that can be solved, like tuberculosis, mumps, measles, hepatitis. And what's happening, as you can see on the right-hand chart, is all of the autoimmune conditions, autism, ADD, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, are absolutely exploding in numbers. So now we have an uh, unbelievable figure where back 40 years ago, only 5% of the children had chronic conditions by the age of 10. Now 38% of the children have chronic conditions that will last a lifetime. That's from 5% to 38%, and then this chart is absolutely the best one to explain why. These are autoimmune conditions. Almost all of them have their roots during the pregnancy period. Slide number nine is the American Medical Association has said, our medical system is not gonna work unless we start predicting and preventing diseases. Clear and simple, that's the key to it. And it has profound implications in our special needs world, especially with autism. Slide number 10, gives us the first really good look at what's happening and the reason why, and that is when they did empirical core blood work 
of mothers, they found that these chemicals were getting into the baby and damaging the baby during the pregnancy period with the thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals that mothers were being exposed to. And the next slide, number, number 11, it became part of a whole issue of pediatrics uh, uh, done by the CDC saying 95% of all the women have such high levels of toxins in their system at birth, it's affecting every baby born. Some of them very severely, and those have names like childhood leukemia. It affects autism, attention deficit disorder. We now have a very firm scientific basis. So here's the problem on slide number 12. Right now, from preconception to five years old, we have 31% miscarriages, 12% preterm, 30% mental and medical conditions by the age of five. This means that it's over a 50% problem rate from, oh, let's have a child, to, oh, I've got a problem, serious problem. So slide number uh, 13, uh, all of us are aware uh, of the autism rates uh, of 1 in 50, but take a look at these other areas. Uh, cancer is the second leading cause of death in children, one out of 200 uh, children. And, and look at that information underneath, Shannon. Only 5% of this is genetic. The rest is exposures. We now have pretty conclusive evidence from the University of Cal Berkeley that childhood leukemia is a result of 22 chemicals in the right combination during the pregnancy period. We know it from blood spot tests. We know it from kids with leukemia. It has nothing to do with genetics, only a small percentage. These are predictable and preventable conditions. So you go right down the list with obesity, dyspraxia, ADD, celiac, allergic eczema, almost all of these are primarily exposures. Now, what do the genes play? On 14, the program that we're suggesting is every single child, rather than the heel prick test, testing a few things, the heel prick test at birth tests baby genes and slide number 15 is exposures. These are the chemicals in the baby system. So we know at the time of birth how to go ahead and predict and prevent some of the conditions that we see, which means predicting autism, predicting celiac disease, predicting cancers, and see if we can go ahead and stop that before they manifest. All of this will be done, 16, is highly expensive and innovative new technology that can do this fast and quick. Kirkman has invested $5 million in this technology, and we're going to be the leaders in the field. Uh, one of them is mass spec machines that with one drop of blood, we can go ahead and measure up to 6,000 chemicals in a woman's system before she has a baby. So we can go all the way back to preconception. Same thing with genetics. We can determine high-risk cases before pregnancy and try to go ahead and avoid them. Exposures, it's called exposome, but we're dealing with exposures. And by the way, Shannon, this isn't just chemicals. A lot of the exposure, as much as 50%, is coming from what do we call the microbiome. That's the bacteria. If you want to have bad bacteria, you'll eat meat and sugars. If you want to have good bacteria, you'll take great probiotics and also eat vegetables and fruits. During the pregnancy period, these eating patterns are critical because they affect things done. Uh, the next slide is how do we go ahead and get this information out? What I've just done is I've basically just laid out the fact that we can go ahead and prevent most of the chronic diseases of the world with our children, a $500 billion medical issue right now, but much more importantly, it affects children we love. And we do this by using technology to get the information so everybody can participate in a global discussion, including parents that already have children with special conditions. They've got a place to go a robust, exciting place to go, and that's the P2I Global Campus. And slide number 18 gives you a snapshot of these pavilions. This is like you're an avatar walking into the most wonderful medical conference you've ever been at. It can operate on your cell phones. There's monorails will take you around, and they're a wonderful avatar. Slide number 19, this is based on a virtual campus technology that no one's seen before. Uh, uh, IBM Watson we're partnering with. You'll be getting your information about, is your lipstick too toxic from avatars? Checking products out, checking contamination levels, getting lab test results understood. This is a very interesting technology we've been working on for the last four years. Slide number 20 is really important. 
for those of you out there, that is our great friend, Dr. Berger. He is probably one of the leading half a dozen uh, doctors that specializes in autism and special needs children. What most people don't know is David has quietly been doing this protocol of no toxins and great foods during the pregnancy period. And take a look at this, Shannon. If you've read this article, he's saying that from preconception to infancy, we can have environmental and nutritional strategies to lower the risk of autism, and by the way, everything else. Out of the 1,000 births, David, instead of having the 38% miscarriage, David's had three or four miscarriages out of 1,000 uh, women. In terms of preterm, which create 10-point drops in IQs and a host of uh, health problems, David has only had 1% or less preterm babies. He's only had three cesarean births. They're all natural childbirths to full term. And here's the big take home. He doesn't have 38% chronic conditions in his five, six, seven, eight year olds. They've got two or three kids or a problem kids out of a thousand. This is a huge story. So we went down with the CDC to officials, the University of Georgia officials to talk to David. And this is the basis of the protocols we're running. It's a 175-page protocol that David Berger has put together with other doctors. And we have proof within our own community of incredible results. Let's just take one example on uh, slide 21. This is a very good study done out of Denmark. And women during the pregnancy period, they want to go ahead and maybe drink Diet Coke. Take a look at these figures, Shannon. If they have one Diet Coke a day, it increases the preterm baby rate by 18%. If they take four Diet Cokes a day, the sweetener in there will increase the risk of preterm babies, which greatly increases the risk of autism and multiple sclerosis and all kinds of conditions by 72%. Well, who knows that? On this campus and in the medical protocols, all of this will be uh, taught. Slide 21 is going to be this fabulous interactive book that will take people step by step by step during the pregnancy process. Doctors will take CME courses on the campus. Parents will know where to go. And, and this gives people a chance. And by the way, all of this is going to be free. All of it is going to be paid by uh, people that uh, are sponsoring this uh, technology. So if we go to slide number 11, uh, this gets back to the Doreen Grand Pache mm -hmm. test of one-year-olds. We're going to have information on how if a child at one, how to spot them from early signs of autism, and how to go ahead and do the, what's called an Early Start Denver Model Program, which can go ahead and repair some of the problems with the brain circuitry. And Doreen Grand Pache studies show that not only do these kids not develop autism from one to two and a half, but they jumped 18 points in IQ with an average of about 125 to 130, really little professors. And here's something really cool, that starting at about seven to eight months, we'll be opening up a center of excellence in Atlanta with the University of Georgia. We've got the best uh, people in the state of Georgia that understand these issues. Dr. Cordero used to work for the CDC. This is mainline stuff, uh, Shannon. This is people that are believing in the program. In this center, we'll see about 800 uh, families. But for those families that can't go down there, They'll get the same information on the campus. They can look up with local doctors. We also want to develop uh, pavilions on the campus for parents with children so they can communicate with each other, they can gather information, and there'll never be a charge for information on the campus. You can take the CME courses along with the doctors for free. And uh, again, what we're really doing is we're, we're, we're letting people understand there's a new way of evaluating information, getting great information. And as we reduce the risk of chronic cases, such as autism, we're going to provide more money for parents to be able to serve the needs of their children and uh, as they go through and, and need uh, services. So again, this has been work with hundreds of people, lots of meetings. But we now have consensus uh, among our faculty members is the a uh, former person who was chair of the OBGYN Society. She's presented this to the World Health Organization. So we've made a lot of progress since we've talked to you last time. We 
are in the last stages now, and we're putting together the last of the funding. So if any of the viewers out there get excited saying, wow, I would have loved to have been part of solving polio and helping that project, they can contact me. It's a nonprofit, and they can be part of a historical change in the way our parents get information and the way that we go ahead and prevent chronic illness. So I know I went through a lot of information in a hurry. And now I've got questions. Is now a good time for me to ask questions? Yes. Okay, so I love this idea that at the core of this, we're looking at predicting and preventing chronic issues that are you know, difficult. You know, we're talking about pediatric cancers, we're talking about pediatric diabetes, you know, those preterm births. And in amongst all this, we have autism. And I, and I think this is really incredible. But as you were talking about it, some of these things we already know, some of these things we already have in place, and some of these things are things that are about to come and that we'll have the ability to use. So what do, are we able to get on the campus, the virtual campus yet for P2I, or is that still something that's on its way to us? The campus is developed, it's ready to go. We're now seeking funding okay. uh, with a group in Washington, D.C. we're working on, headed by Lee Grossman, who was the former head of Autism Society, the Autism Society of America. And we need to do that so we can launch this uh, properly. So we expect the funding to be in place within three or four months, and then the campus and the Center of Excellence will be launched. So to be clear, uh, yeah. this, the, a lot of the studies, I mean, this is, this is not something in the future. The studies are there. The consensus is there among your faculty. We already know you, those things that you were showing us about, that genetics play a very small role, but there are these other things. Those are things that we already know and that work has been done. But the campus where we can get our information for free, that's where we need the funding right now to get the information out there. Am uh, I, correct. Am I warm? And, uh, once we have the campus up, uh, then it's self-funding because we're going to have all kinds of exhibitors with toxic-free products, just like exhibitors in a medical conference. And we had to make a choice, Shannon. Do we build a training for doctors that then tell parents the information, or do we build a campus for doctors and parents and democratize the information so parents can be in control of their child and their child's future and the future of their friends that are asking questions. So we built this really for the public. You can hold 150,000 people a day. And, and I, I thank you for that. It's one of the reasons why I love talking to you because I think you get it that this is moving at such a fast rate that parents need the information. And, right. and so I love this. Now, I, I, in, in talking to you last week, and this is one of the reasons why I get so excited because there's so much information. And, but one of the things that we talked about, I shared with you that we had a lot of people um, getting very emotional when we were talking about how to prevent autism, that there's a book that's out about that, and that people who have kids that are older on the spectrum had some emotions about that and felt like that, that really they took on guilt and felt like they were being blamed because they ate or, or breathed something in, and you had a really interesting take on why those folks need to feel guilt-free, but also why they need to get behind this research and how it's gonna benefit all of us. Did you wanna share that? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people uh, that I've known that are adults uh, with special conditions, including uh, autism and uh, Asperger's. Uh, and the, the part I notice is many of these people are highly intelligent. I don't believe that what's happening with autism is a defective gene. I think the autism genes uh, are creating difficulty when the frontal lobal area is affected by pesticides. And what we're going to find is what Doreen found, and that is that we can get rid of the damage caused by the toxins and pesticides during the pregnancy period what we're going to have is not normal people. We're going to have above normal people. And we're going to have kids with 120, 30 IQs. And that's really allowing them to be who they really are. And at the same time, that the fact that this was caused by chemicals, nobody knew about this. And nobody should be feeling guilty because to be able to understand the problem, you've got to be able to test and see what 
conditions you have. I mean, who knew that lipstick had lead in it and baby food had uh, lead in it and bleach uh, had mercury in it. So what we do now is we take the pain and misery that we've gone through, and I've got two special needs grandchildren, and, and my son died of a neurological condition. We take all of that pain, and we said it's going to count for something, and we're going to help go ahead and bring the next generation in. And I think the autism gene is going to be seen as a progressive gene rather than regressive. It's really the damage being caused by the pesticides that create the problem that we know as autism. And I talked to Temple Granite about it, and she agrees completely that what will happen is we're going to see that these are going to be the people that build our, our bridges and, uh, uh, and uh, do our scientific work, and it's going to be the Bill Gates of the world. So, Which uh, is, a, I think, a, a much better way of looking at it. And for people who have kids that are affected, highly affected by autism and saying, oh, you know, I... I wished I'd known. One of the things that you said to me is that since there are so many kids right now in the system, that there's not enough money to go around and that when we start reducing the number of kids who need that money, it's going to mean that there are, nobody's going to get left behind. There's going to be more funding to be able to do the kinds of programs that we need to do with our older kids that are more affected. Shannon, uh, I know and you know that there are existing programs out there that could provide meaningful jobs uh, to the people in our community, meaningful housing solutions to people in our community as they get older, and uh, retirement with uh, dignity. All of that will not happen if we do not take the cost of children with very, very expensive needs and services. If we can reduce that we can go ahead and put a lot more focus where it should be, and that's on existing children. And as I talk to parents, their needs change from when their kids were three or four years old to now, I know a lot of parents, they want to make sure their child has a good job, and they want to make sure that their child has a, a, a great life with dignity. And every time I hear these stories, it makes me feel so great, and I want to spend my time doing that. But I know that I've got to go upstream and see who's throwing these kids in the river. Yeah. And then we go ahead and solve that, and then we take care of, of people that, uh, that benefit, from our, uh, uh, benefit from our help. And when I say help, I mean, I used to be a practicing attorney, and I thought I was a big shot. I have never been happier in my life because I'm working with a community that I love yeah. and parents that I love. And when I, I get a call on a success story, just that one story makes it all worthwhile for me. So uh, I really don't want to say that we're interested in the abstract. We're interested in real kids, real families, getting a lot more attention than they are right now. And this is my way of doing it. Well, it's an, it's an amazing. I still have a couple more questions. You brought up the sure. pesticides. Because as you were talking and you said, you know, if you've got a diet that's, you know, full of meat and sugars, there's going to be certain things, but you need to have the diet that's got more healthy things, probiotics, and has those vegetables in them. But we need to be clear with folks, because you brought up the pesticides, it's not just any vegetable. We have to have clean, a clean food source, correct? Well, okay. Here's a, uh, something everybody's going to remember uh, for years to come. We did a toxicity equivalent, and one peach sprayed normally with pesticides that you find in your Safeway store has the equivalent pesticides in it to harm baby of eight cigarettes. So when you eat a peach during the pregnancy period, it's the same as if you'd smoke eight cigarettes. And when we start adding them up, the average mother during the pregnancy period is doing the equivalency of three packs of cigarettes a day. So we need to have clean food sources. David Berger is very clear about this. No restaurant food during the pregnancy period, pesticide-free food, or wash the fruit off, and then get tested so you know what your baseline is. And I talked to one mother, real quick comment. A wonderful mother did everything right, except every night they went down and they ate sushi. And when she got tested, her child uh, developed uh, autism. When she got tested, they were sky high in mercury because she made one mistake. That's why the testing is going to be important. So you can see, oh my gosh, I've got too much mercury, and get that out of the system 
before the baby comes because that will be affecting the child. Okay. And you showed, we saw the slide where you had the two different kinds of machines that could test. Are, is that something that's available now or is that something that's coming soon? Yeah, Kirkman's going to be introducing this in a division called Purity, and Purity is going to become the leader in digital testing for insurance approved testing for pesticides and for toxicity and for very low cost genetics. We have a new technology I just want to mention to you. Rather than pricking the finger, Shannon, with blood to get that one drop, yes. we're developing a patch you put on your arm that after two minutes, you pull the patch off your child's arm and we can do the IgG tests, the IgA tests, and the tests for many of the toxicities. And that will simplify uh, blood testing. It's ouchless and painless blood testing we're developing. See, this is why I love having you around. You talk about things and I get so excited. So for people who want more information, there is a website that they can go to now, correct? Where can we send them? Uh, let me send you the, the link because I know we just put up new information okay. as a placeholder. But also, uh, I'm really available, Kirkman, uh, Kirkman Group. Uh, everybody knows how to get the number. And by calling me and asking for Dave Humphrey, asking them for my cell phone, one of the joys in my life is talking to parents that say, Dave, I need more information about something. And uh, I've got all the time in the world to do that. But let's so be serious here. Problems. You guys need some funding. You need some serious funding to make this happen and to make this more available. Um, be, in order to get it, information that you just shared and to get more of that information out, you need some funding for your campus. So if people are aware of companies that want to be a part of this, this is the direction we need to go. This is the positive discussion. This is where things can be improved. There could be a listener out there right now that is saying, wow, maybe I can talk to Dave and I can be the one that makes a difference in having all of this happen right now yeah. and forever be connected to solving chronic disease with children. This is so important. And I would love to get that uh, call and would uh, uh, allow that person to come and be part of this. I can't think of a better thing to do with with someone's legacy than this. This Absolutely. is it. Absolutely, to have that be your legacy. We also want to say too, we've had Dr. David Berger on the show before. We adore him and if you, uh, you can watch the interviews that we've done with him. Um, if you are thinking of having a, another baby or you know someone who is and you would like to reduce your risk significantly for all of the things that we talked about, having a, a miscarriage or a preterm baby, having a baby that is born with any kind of chronic disease or a child that will eventually develop autism, if you want to significantly more than anything else has ever reduced your risk, have that happen. It's a very specific, there is no one size fits all. You can talk to Dr. David Berger. He, if you have telehealth in your state, I know because he's been on the show before, you can do telehealth with him. If you have a naturopath here, they can telehealth with him in Florida or you can go visit him in Florida and uh, a thousand births and his statistics are unmatchable. I'll, I'll end with one thing because I know our time is short. David uh, helped form a group called MAPS with me, Medical Academy of Special Needs uh, uh, Physicians. Uh, and David went three years ago and taught his protocol for P2I, along with a couple of other associates, in front of 200 doctors. And they all listened with disbelief because they couldn't believe what a successful record he had. And here's the cool thing. Three years later, most of those doctors came back for a refresher course we just had. Yeah. And they had been delivering by that time hundreds of babies. They're getting exactly the result as Dr. Berger. In other words, this stuff is really exciting. Yeah. Because you all out there have friends. Maybe you're thinking about another child. This is a route to go, and you're exactly right. David either would know somebody or he himself could accommodate you. But look, we're looking at getting this available in everybody's hometown yes. free. Yes. So thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you. We adore you, and we look forward to having you back on whenever you have time. Okay, and actually, you're my hero, too. You've done so much for this community, and we all just uh, really treasure 
the fact that you're here for us. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. You're the treasure. Thank you so much. And say hi, hi to everybody there at Kirkman for us. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. An amazing gentleman. And, you know, we really sped through those slides, but you can go back through and, and slow them up. Um, amazing. I especially, you know, there are a couple of slides that I want to particularly draw your attention to if you go back and look at them. The one where all the toxicities are that's color-coded. Um, when you look at the, all the different kinds of pesticides that are on there, it's amazing. Uh, I would go to a break, but I don't want to waste time and go to a break because uh, I, want to, I want to have an opportunity to at least do our uh, autism in the classroom because we didn't have a chance to do it two weeks ago. We've been talking about summer slide for autism in the classroom and, and this phenomenon that teachers call it the summer slide because kids lose ground during the summer. And for those of us who have kids who are on the autism spectrum, we can't afford that. Um, in fact, we need to make up ground. And so this is an, an ideal time over the summer. We have five things that we recommend, and we've already talking, uh, talked about reading and writing and how you can do that at any level with kids and that it really helps supercharge them. So this one might be a little bit of a, of a surprise to you, but number three on our list of things to do is draw. Um, and, and here's the thing, when we talked about writing, and you can go back and watch that one, we talked about at different levels, how you're working on holding a crayon or holding a pencil or holding a pen, whatever. Well, when you're drawing, you're really putting into motion that activity. It actually will help with their tripod grasp so that it'll help the writing too, but you're working on different areas of the brain when you're drawing. In fact, the book that I recommend to you is Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's not difficult reading, and it is something that uh, Betty Edwards, who taught art, put out. It's not something sp specifically for people with autism. Um, it's just a book in how we can shift our our drawing mind to the right side of our brain because the and she explains in great detail how there's two halves of our brains and they deal with different tasks and that when we can sharpen uh, different sides of our brains for different tasks and when we can sharpen our ability to go back and forth between the lobes we will see that we will be more productive at more things and that when you first start to work on shifting something from the left brain to the right brain or the right brain to the left brain, it actually causes anxiety in the beginning, but as you get better at it, it can reduce anxiety. So I encourage you to read the book, but there are some great exercises in that book that you can do with anyone. A couple of summers ago, that was my thing, and Gem and I did exercises from drawing on the right side of the brain, and I saw such a benefit for both of us. Um, really, I, I saw a benefit to his speech as a result of it, and it can be very fun to draw something. I think with little kids, kids um, we always want to be praising them for whatever they draw and not um, try to get them to do a certain thing but drawing on the right side of the brain won't cause that but it will cause them to shift which side of the brain they're working on drawing with because to be really good um, and productive you want to be on the right side of your brain when you draw because you get into deep deep creativity and actually can create beautiful beautiful things and reduce your anxiety so check it out you can do it for yourself first do the exercise and then modify it for your child make sure as with all the things that we talked about it has to be reinforcing and drawing to start I look at the, the videos of Wyatt and Wyatt loved to draw and paint. My kid didn't love it. I, you know, Wyatt will sit, if you give Wyatt paper and he will sit and draw and draw and draw, my kid wouldn't want to do that. So make sure that you only do it for an amount of time that's reinforcing and that you pair something that's reinforcing with it so that your kid enjoys drawing. It will have huge, huge benefits for them. Let them be creative, but if you want to, I encourage you to use drawing on the right side of the brain for yourself and for your kiddo um, to, you know, find ways to be even more productive. Don't really have time for mindfulness except to say that we were talking about time and I want to say to you that when you start to feel anxious, 
give yourself time to experience this moment in time and then it's gone and then there's this moment in time that that can be a way to get your breath centered and to be present and if you can only do that for three seconds that is three seconds of mindfulness it will actually reduce your anxiety for the rest of the day so exciting to be back we're going to be back next week with great shows and we're going to try to join in with two amazing conferences and a little bit later today we're going to make sure that we keep our appointment with bonnie yates and we will broadcast that after we've filmed it that will be a little bit later check for it on youtube and on facebook live I'm so grateful to both of our guests today, Alex Plank, and to the fabulous David Humphrey, uh, P2I, amazing. All right, uh, I will see you a little bit later on today with Bonnie Yates. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.